You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 26. Well, welcome back. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. Well, welcome to the 26th episode. The main topic we're going to be talking about today is milk yield. I've had quite a few questions over the last oh, month or so, and people ask me, how do I figure out how much cheese I'm going to get for the amount of milk that I use? Well, milk normally has a specific gravity. This is uh, raw milk of uh, 1.033 uh, for raw milk, and that's around room temperature. So w- milk does weigh more than water, but so in cheese making, the yield is a term for the amount of cheese that result from a certain volume of milk, and that varies from the type of milk, the, the animal you get it from, even more so the amount of uh, fat in the milk and the uh, moisture to water content of the cheese. So the yield is normally given in uh, weight after salting and aging. Now, remember, during aging, a lot of the the moisture, a lot of the water evaporates out of the cheese or dries off out of the cheese. So here's some indicative uh, figures. Uh, It's all in metric, so I apologise to those in the the US. So basically, for cream cheese, you'll get about a 20% yield. For feta, you'll get about a 13% yield. Camembert, between 14... Uh, sorry, 12 and 14%. Gouda and cheddar, roughly the same sort of hardness, about 10%. And Parmesan and Romano, around 7 to 8% of cheese to milk. So what I will do, I've uh, found this information on cheeseforum.org. So I will pop it into the show notes so you can have a look. It's got weight, uh, weights for 3 litres, 5 litres, 10 litres, and 20 litres of milk, and then there's actually a yield table for the US, and it's in gallons. So it'll tell you how many kilograms of cheese you'll get out of uh, the milk for your specific cheese that you're going to make. Now, you've got to remember that when you cut the curd, and, and from experience after having made many, many cheeses, that cream cheese, that you don't cut the curds at all, so therefore the whey doesn't get expelled in the normal way. It just... Um, the whey drips out of the of the curds in a bag. And that happens over the period of about 12 hours. So there's no pressing, it's all by gravity. And then when you think about how you make a Parmesan Romano, you cut the curds so small and you stir for ages and then you heat the milk up to around 50 degrees Celsius and that way it expels so much whey, pardon the pun, too many ways, so it expels so much of the water um, that's within the uh, the solid, which is your curd. So therefore, your yield is going to be a lot, lot less when you make a, a, a high temperature, very small curd cheese compared to one like cream cheese or even feta, because with feta, you cut the curds really large and only stir for about 20 minutes. So that's how you estimate the yield of your uh, milk to cheese weight. Um, like I said, I'll pop that in the in the show notes. Now that leads me on to the the first question. It's a voicemail question, uh, and it's from Suri, and I will just play it now. Hi, Gavin. I've long since been organic, but only this week I started making my own cheeses and I found your videos fabulous. They're short, they're to the point, they're easy to follow and good for you, mate. I have a question about fat content. Last night I made farmer's cheese with two and a half litres of 3% fat milk. That means that there is 75 grams of fat in the total two and a half litres. What was produced was 350 grams of cheese. I actually want a high-fat cheese, but is all the 75 grams of fat now in that cheese, or was some of it left in the way? Do you have any idea of how this whole thing functions? I'd be very interested to know. Thanks very, very much. 
Uh, thank you, Suri. Um, now, after a lot of research, um, and I had to do a, a, a lot of uh, Googling to find the answer, and then I really couldn't find an answer anyway. So here's a guess. It's a very educated guess, of course. Now, most of the fat does um, reside as a solid within the milk, and when you coagulate the milk using rennet, then uh, most of the fat stays within the solids, it stays within the curd. You'll notice that a lot of the, and, and it depends on what cheese you make, of course, that a lot of the fat will stay within the cheese itself, within the curd, and there will be hardly any uh, in the whey. Most of the whey is protein, and that's all that's left behind. So let's do some simple maths. I'm assuming uh, that most of your fat is left in the cheese. So in the cheese solid you made, so 75 grams. So you said that the final weight of your cheese was 350 grams. So basically I divided 75 grams by 350 times that by 100, and that gave me a fat content of 21.4%. Now, I would plus or minus... <laughs> plus or minus a few, um, a few percentages there based on how well the milk coagulated and how much of the whey was creamy um, after you finished separating that from the curds. So roughly between 20 and I'd say 22% fat content of your, of your cheese, about 20 to 20% of it is fat, and that's good. What I actually found, though, was the fat contents of different cheeses. So I'll just uh, rattle a few off there. So for the softer cheeses like, so Camembert uh, has a fairly low fat content of around 22%. Um, that's because the curds are a lot higher. So a lot of the, uh, the soft cheeses like uh, mozzarella are around 20%. And then they start going, cottage cheese is about 3%. Uh, maybe a little bit higher, sometimes up to eight, depends if they put cream in it. But a lot of the uh, the semi-hard cheeses like Gouda and Colby, they range from around 27 to 30% fat. Uh, the highest fat content is of the semi-hard cheeses is cheddar, um, and that's around 31 to 33%. Um, but when people start adding um, cream to the uh, to the cheese, like a double cream brie or something like that, that gets up to about 40 to about 44%. So they're the sort of percentages of fat that you'll find in those sort of cheeses. And what I'll do, I've got a table here. I will pop that in the show notes as well. So I've got some other listener questions here, and these are all via email. I only received one via voicemail this week. I love a lot more. Um, don't be shy. Uh, use the speak pipe widget on the littlegreencheese.com blog. And it's pretty simple. Most uh, computers these days have a microphone built in. Just make sure that uh, when you do record it, play it back to see if it's any good. I was replying back to a few people tonight uh, on some of the voicemails. And uh, lucky I did check because uh, the recordings were so overdriven I couldn't even understand them myself. Um, I had accidentally selected the microphone that is in my webcam and not the normal microphone I use to record these lovely podcasts. Anyway, so the first question is from uh, Jeff. It uh, doesn't say where Jeff's from, but Jeff says, Hi Gavin, I'm hoping for some advice. I made a Monterey for the first time back in the end of April. I waxed it and it was seeping from fairly early on. I monitored it frequently and would wipe down, wipe it down, turn it, etc. Anyway, I let it go for a couple of weeks and checked again today, and over the two weeks, quite a bit of seepage occurred. Today I'm deciding to suck it up and assume that it's a lost cause, and I took the wax off. The surface was very damp, and the cheese quite soft. I tried it and found that it wasn't near as bitter as I thought it would be, Actually, it was a very, very mild taste, nearly tasteless. So my question is, what next? Let it sit and re-wax, eat it as is. Any suggestions would be great. Thanks, Jeff. 
Well, Jeff, my advice to you would be to actually eat it now. Um, I wouldn't let it mature any longer because what I think the issue is, seepage is usually a and mild taste is usually is usually under acidification uh, during the cheese making process. Uh, and it can be caused by a lack of bacterial development during the ripening stage. So therefore, what I think has happened is that you may not have added enough starter culture um, or let it acidify long enough to prevent this as you press it. Another thing, uh, when you're maturing cheese in the very first week, don't forget to turn it a couple of times a day. This will prevent the moisture, sorry, this will distribute the fat and the moisture evenly through the cheese. So turn it a couple of times a day for the first week and then turn it weekly as it matures. Don't forget to turn it because honestly, this is the main cause of seepage is under acidification. So not adding not enough starter and not letting it ripen long enough as per the recipe and not turning your cheese regularly. So, Jeff, thanks very much for your question. I hope that's answered it. Now, the next question is from, this is from Shelley. Um, Shelley doesn't say where she is from as well. Um, Shelley says, hello, Gavin. I've just found your site and I'm thoroughly enjoying it. I've just started making different cheeses and so far they look okay. Too, too soon to say anything about the taste. A question, if I may, Gavin. I have just ordered a food vacuum machine and was wondering, would there be a need to purchase a bar fridge in which to keep the cheeses or by vacuum sealing, would I need, would I be able to use my existing fridge? The cheeses I've made so far are brie, camembert, kefili, gorgonzola and cream cheese. Maybe I'll need an extra cheese, a fridge by the time I finish. Uh, regards, Shelley. Shelley, you go. I think to mature your cheeses properly, um, I think you're going to have to purchase a, a fridge, uh, whether that be a bar fridge or a normal size fridge, and be able to regulate the temperature. Now, a brie and camembert, yeah, you can get away with maturing them in a normal refrigerator. They will take a little bit longer. And probably for beginners, it's probably a good idea because um, if you have a too high a temperature, you'll find that the, the, the brie and camembert will off-gas ammonia and that'll put you off making those cheeses. Kefili, because it only takes three weeks, is probably another good cheese you can put into the, the normal refrigerator. However, I find that uh, ripening uh, any semi-hard cheeses at around 12 to 13 degrees Celsius is optimum. Um, this lets the bacteria in the cheese to um, fully assert itself, to multiply, to grow and to um, change the acidity of the cheese and to change the flavour of the cheese. So I highly recommend that you purchase a fridge that you can regulate the temperature around you know, 12 to, um, to 13 degrees. Now my cheese fridge, it can go down to four. That's fantastic because if I don't use the external thermostat, but I can I can get it up to you know twenty any degrees any temperature I want because I've got an external thermostat that I set and I monitor with a, with a remote thermometer and hygrometer um, and I can tell the uh, the ex, the internal temperature without it opening the fridge and I can tell the rel relative humidity as well. Look, I may have gone a little bit too far as a home cheese maker, but I find that equipment is crucial to getting your cheese the same. So when you're using the same recipe, you want to be able to mature it the same so you get that lovely taste that you're used to so yeah hopefully Shelley that's answered your question um, if you can get a second hand fridge that's fantastic you can also pick up those um, those external thermostats I think I've got a link on my website to, uh, there's an eBay uh, link there and it's fair, they're fairly easy to use you can use them for uh, all sorts of things I think the one I've got is actually um, it says it's a reptile thermostat um, but uh, the instructions also come with it that if you hold down the centre button uh, for about four seconds, it turns into a cooling thermostat uh, and you can use it for a cheese fridge. OK, thanks very much, Shelley. Thanks for your question. Uh, the next question is from this one's from Eric and Eric is from somewhere in Australia. Eric says, thank you for the time for taking the time to read my email. Oh, I'm from Sydney. Oh, 
Hello, Sydney. It's Eric from Sydney. I'm a big fan of uh, hobby cheese making uh, and I am extending an email because I need some professional help. Well, Eric, I'm not professional. I'm just a home cheese maker that likes to talk about it on a uh, podcast. So Eric's question is, my hard, soft, aged fresh cheese have become somewhat of a hit uh, amongst my friends, family and neighbours. I've just recently upgraded all my cheese making equipment to increase the demand of my cheese lovers. I was hoping you could help me on how to alter the starter cultures, cheese recipes, cooking method, pressing and ageing of larger quantities. I was making seven to eight litres at a time, but now looking to make something of around 45 litres. I do not want to take up too much of your time, as I'm certain you're busy. All right, um, thanks in advance, Eric. Okay, my answer to Eric is this, and thanks for your question, Eric. Uh, I'm not sure about the food handling laws in New South Wales, but you might want to investigate those before you start making artisan size quantities. Um, If one of your customers gets sick and it is shown that you have not taken due care in preparing your uh, cheese um, and that your food prep area is not up to scratch, you probably won't have a, a leg to stand on as far as litigation goes. That's my first comment. The second comment is... That that aside, recipes are very easy to upscale. Uh, all you have to do is double the ingredients. So, for instance, if the recipe calls for eight litres of milk and X amount of starter and, and so on and so forth, all you do, if you're going to use 16 litres, then you double the recipe. For 32 litres, double it again. Um, I've used this method successfully to make all of my larger size cheeses. So it's it's very easy to upscale. So uh, the, the period of... Uh, renneting and the period of acidification after you add the starter culture is the same. Don't double that. Just double the ingredients. So the time periods are exactly the same because basically you're adding more ingredient to more ingredient. Um, so you, so keep your time frames the same. Keep your curd sizes the same. You're pressing weights the same as well. doesn't matter how size. You need that many um, either pounds or kilo, kilograms of pressure to press your cheese. But uh, best of luck, and uh, and if you uh, need to investigate it, there's actually a lovely lady called Deborah Allard that I know has made commercial quantities. She used to run a, a cheese company or help with a cheese company, and I interviewed her. Uh, in episode 12, I interviewed Deborah Allard, and I think her uh, detail, contact details may be there. If not, she runs a Facebook page called Cheeses Loves You. So just search in Facebook for Cheeses Loves You, and she may be able to answer your question. Anyway, thanks very much for your question, Eric. And the last one is not a question. It is a it's a plug for a friend. Now, those of you who have listened to every single podcast episode, you would have known in episode two, I interviewed Liz Beavis. Uh, and Liz comes from Nanango in Queensland. Now, Liz has had a house cow for quite a few years. She's had quite a few house cows now. And uh, she has written a book, and it's an e-book, and it's called Our Experience with House Cows uh, by Elizabeth Beavis. And I happen to have a review copy, and I've read it, and it is a very great tale of how she has kept house cows for the last few years on a, uh, on a small acreage block. So uh, she's dedicated to dedicated the book to her dear house cows, Bella and Molly, um, and her favourite dairy farmer, Matt, who has taught them to love cows. And they're lovely. Uh, they look like Jersey cows to me. Yes, they are. And the book's lovely. It's, um, it's I'll tell you how many, it's 40 pages long. Uh, it's got some lovely uh, references, and it's got some very good tips on uh, on how to keep cows and how to keep them healthy and how to breed them and so many things. So what I'll do, I'm going to put a link to the uh, the book uh, where Liz is selling it online. It's relatively cheap. Um, so I'll pop that into the show notes. Oh, good news. I've actually found two more questions. Hang on, I'll just, uh, I'll just pull these up. These are late entries to the, <laughs> the podcasting question list. Uh, this one's from Stuart. Uh, Stuart says, hi, Gavin, I'm looking to start making cheese and really enjoyed your uh, blog and podcast. It has been a real great help. Uh, I have a question regarding non-homogenized milk. I found some milk that I think will be appropriate for making cheese, but the cream is fairly separated 
and seemingly no amount of shaking will mix up the clumps. Any suggestions about how to get the most out of my milk? Keep up the good work, Stuart. Well, thanks for your question, Stuart. Uh, yes, I do have a tip. What I do, I found the same thing in some of the, the milk, the non-homogenized milk I, I have. Yes, there's a big lump of cream at the top, and depending on the age of the milk, if it's getting close to its use-by date, then obviously the milk, the cream's going to be harder. Uh, what I do is I fill a sink up with hot water from the tap, and I pop the milk in there. It floats a little bit. However, it... Um, it doesn't melt the cream uh, at the top, but it loosens it up enough after about 30 minutes that you can then mix it into the milk by shaking the bottle. So all I do is then crack the seal on the milk bottle. That lets a bit of air into the into the built into the the bottle, uh, and then I give it a thorough shake. And usually that uh, is enough to mix the milk and the cream together, and then you just pour it into your pot. Now you also will find that um, if you can't do that for whatever reason, that if you pour the whole lot into your milk pot anyway, as you heat it up to the the target temperature of, you know, between 30 and maybe 33 degrees, you'll find that the cream will dissipate and you'll be able to stir it into the milk anyway. But I find it best if you can mix the milk and the cream together, just pop it into a sink uh, of warm water out of the tap or hot water out of the tap and yeah, that'll help the uh, the cream mix into the milk. So I hope that little tip helps. Thanks very much for your question, Stuart. Now I've got a um, a rather long question here. I won't read all of it out. It's from oh, and I hope I don't get this wrong. This is a uh, Trousty. Uh, Trousty is from originally from Iceland. Um, she grew up in Denmark, has worked over all over Europe, and now she lives in Peru. Uh, now, she's talking about um, cheese is very expensive in Peru. Um, but the the crux of the question is that because uh, blue cheese, so Penicillium Roque 40 uh, culture is very expensive in Peru, uh, what she has done is she's taken a, 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 a blue cheese that she's purchased and she's taken some of the blue mould out of it and she's mixed that with a little bit of milk and what she did when she she made her cheese, uh, that uh, she added the uh, the culture that she made up with milk and uh, and the blue cheese, and she added it to her curds. And the question is that she wants to know if will this work? Well, uh, from experience, uh, yes, it will. Um, I have done this before because I was desperate for some uh, Penicillium Roque Forty one day. And I have found that it actually works. If you take a little bit of blue cheese, and especially the blue, the vein, the uh, the Penicillium Roque 40 that's visible within the vein, and you mix that up with a little bit of warm milk, not too warm, just lukewarm, and you give that and make sure it's all dissolved, or you can shake it up in a little jar or a bottle or what have you, and let it sit for about 30 minutes to uh, to get going. Uh, once you pour that into your culture, uh, sorry, into your milk before you add the rennet, then you will find that uh, if you follow just a normal, say, Stilton or a blue cheese recipe that I've got on my website, you will get blue cheese. Um, the culture will reactivate um, due to the heat uh, and to the available oxygen. And, uh, yeah, it will work. So hopefully um, that has answered your question. Trousty, I hope that's how you say it. That's the end of the uh, the questions. Um, I don't have any others. Uh, I do have a request, though. I have been trying to find some guests for the show. Um, I have one lined up um, during the next couple of weeks. But I do remember back when I first started the podcast, uh, Little Green Cheese, a while ago, that I was able to get guests and they came out of the woodwork. What I would like is if anybody would like to be a guest on the show, then don't hesitate to send an email to gavin at littlegreencheese.com. Um, just let me know some basic back background and uh, we'll have you on the show. If you've been making uh, cheese for a little while or you've got your own cow or goat, or I would love to hear from you and I dare say all the listeners would too. Uh, there's quite a few listeners to the show now. We're, uh, we're peaking out at about 3,000 um, listens per episode uh, and that's after about four weeks. So I'm very pleased with that. 
Um, it seems like it's a very popular show, and I certainly will not be stopping anytime soon. But if we get some guests, that will be fabulous. So, like I said, drop me an email, gavin at littlegreencheese.com. Thanks very much. All right, well, thanks, everybody, for listening to the show. For If you're local here in the, in the Melbourne area, then there are some cheese-making workshops, and you can find those over on uh, littlegreencheese.com. You can also find my cheese-making book. Uh, it's an e-book called Keep Calm and Make Cheese, The Beginner's Guide to Cheese-Making at Home, and that's available in all e-book formats and all good e-book retailers. I also have lots of cheese-making video tutorials. They're available on YouTube, and all you have to do is search for the user greening of Gavin, uh, and you will find swags of cheese-making video tutorials. So thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music from Kevin McLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop and Call to the Dairy Cows.